Welcome to Reframed, a podcast created to educate, encourage, and inspire parents and professionals. The Gladney Center for Adoption staff know parenting a child that has a history of loss, abuse, neglect, or trauma requires parenting skills and insight to be reframed in order to create a loving and caring environment. Reframed host Emily Moorhead and guests strive to make an impact on our world through topics that are important to you, your family, and our communities. And now, here's your host, Emily Moorhead. Hi, and thanks for joining us for another episode of Reframed. I have Elena Hull with us today, who is an adoptee from Russia, and she is going to share her perspective with us. She's also an author of the book, Through Adopted Eyes. Elena, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> We're super glad to have you. I forgot to mention you're one of Gladney's current interns right now as well. Yes. Yeah. It's My whole life has come full circle. I am from where I was adopted from uh, to, to today. So um, y'all are really getting the whole picture, I guess. Very cool. <laughs> yeah. So Elena, tell me about your adoption story. You're adopted internationally. From what country? So I'm from Russia. I was adopted when I was 18 months old. Okay. And I... Usually in Russia, you go to from the hospital to an orphanage around the age of one, um, but I had some medical concerns, so I was still in the orphan wing of a hospital, 18 months old. Um, my parents came to Gladney in the fall of 94, and then they were home with me by March of 95, um, which is not how adoption is today, um, but they got a VHS tape of me, and uh, they said, okay, we'll take her. <laughs> and um, and so I always grew up knowing I was adopted. Um, a year later, um, my parents came back to Russia and actually got my little sister. We're not blood related, but it's really cool to have a sibling with such a similar uh, origin story. So it's really fun to have a fellow Russian sister. <laughs> That's really cool. They fell in love with you from a VHS tape. That's so sweet. Have they kind of been able to share that story with you as you've grown up and kind of evolved that story to your developmental age and understanding? Yes. One thing that's really interesting is that both of the VHS tapes for my sister and I actually both have our birth names on there. And so one thing with adoption today is there's a lot of confidentiality, but for us, we always knew our birth names, which I think is really special. Mm -hmm. And one thing my parents did that I love and that they worked into conversation a lot is my name's Elena, but that wasn't my birth name. My birth name was Svetlana, and so now that's my middle name. And so uh, my sister, same thing. Her her birth first name is now her middle name. Mm -hmm. And so just to kind of have those traditions with us, we would watch the videos every so often. I think I watched it last year of the, the VHS tape, but just, yeah. And then we have like, both of us have little uh, Russia photo albums as well, just to kind of commemorate their trip when they got us. That's so, really cool. Yeah. So when they came over, to Russia, they started kind of documenting through photos, and, and that's something they preserved for you? Yep, my dad's holding the camcorder, and, mm -hmm. <laughs> and he's ready to, he was just ready to kind of, they were excited to just explore the country, and I'm sure they were nervous, but um, looking back at the pictures is really exciting, and just wondering what's going through their head at the time was, is just crazy to think about. Yeah. Yeah. How long were they in Russia? I am not 100% sure. I'm assuming they were there um, at least a couple of days. I know we were um, at my birth city and then we had to go to Moscow to get some documents. So I'd say around a week for each of us. Yeah. So, yeah. That's really cool. Our families always share who inter adopt internationally that that bonding time can be really sweet because they're learning you, right? Like they're so excited to be parents to you, but they also get this really unique experience of learning your culture. How did your parents integrate your culture into their family culture in the United States? Yeah. Um, well, it's funny that you said the bonding time because my parents remember that the first night with me, I just cried the whole time. So they're like, yeah. oh, this is going well. No, yeah. um, but it all worked out. One of the first things they did was, uh, I talk about this in the book, but they gave me some Cheerios and mm -hmm. that just kind of helped me calm down. And I walked up and down the airplane aisle. And uh, by the time I got home, um, the following Christmas, so I came home in March and then the following Christmas, um, there was apparently something on the TV that had Russian in it. And mm -hmm. apparently when I was a child, I just turned and looked at the TV. And so apparently I maybe recognized what they were saying. Um, and so that was really interesting. My parents always showed us different videos of Russian dances, mm -hmm. um, talked about different ballets, just a lot of um, kind of more stereotypical culture things, but I think they did the best with what they had and what they knew, um, especially being in the 90s and talking about Russia. I think they did a great job and we always cheered for them in the Olympics. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So when you were growing up, what was it like? Did you share your story with kiddos 
um, at school, like with people that you would meet, or was it something that was a little bit more private to you? Yeah, I think my parents always talked very openly and positively about adoption. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of a naive positivity when I was really little. Mm -hmm. So it was just everything about Russia and adoption was always just very exciting. And especially because I don't know really anything about the circumstances for why um, I was available for adoption. Mm -hmm. Um, it was just, why not be positive about it? Right. And so growing up, any time a teacher mentioned Russia, um, just in history class or just whatever it may be, I felt kind of a tug at my heartstring. Mm -hmm. But at that point, it was an exciting tug. It wasn't necessarily a, a deep loss tug uh, yet yeah. when I was in lower elementary school. I remember one time our principal... Um, we would line up to go to recess. And if you were first to line up, that was a really big deal. And he Everyone said, like runs. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, you were the cool kid if you got to go first. And I, I remember the principal said, hey, if you were born in another country, you can line up first. Done. And I stood up and was like, this is the most exciting day of, of my whole life. And so me and my sister and then another girl um, who had immigrated from another country stood up and we ran to the line. And a lot of these teachers were, oh, okay. And they just weren't sure. And I think for some kids that might have felt hard or very like called out. Mm. But I went to a very small school. I was excited about that. And it was my own choice to stand up, you yeah. know, and I, sure. <laughs> so, so I think growing up, it was just, that's a really good picture of what it was, was for me. Mm. And I didn't have that more hard, deeper feelings with my family or really anybody until I was more of a tween. Mm, okay. So yes, yeah, so when I was little, it was just more exciting. Tell me about that tug at your heart in that grief way. Cause that is absolutely a really great way to describe that feeling of like, there is beauty and joy in the celebration of this story. And there's also a lot of hard. So walk me through what that looked like. Yeah, I think as a kid, my parents always taught me to be very um, excited and positive about things. Mm -hmm. But it's really hard to be excited and posit positive about things knowing that you lost something really great, even though I also have something great. So I remember around the age of 12, I it just hit me that I've been so naively positive about adoption and there is a family that I don't have anymore. Mm. And especially not knowing why is really sad and hard. And I think if I have, if I knew the circumstances for why um, I was available for adoption, it might be easier. I don't know. Mm. Um, and so I just started feeling a little bit more sad about that. Mm. But what's interesting, and this is different for everybody, but it didn't take me very long to snap out of it. <laughs> and I think I went from naive positivity to just being realistic about the whole thing mm -hmm. and just saying, you know, I might not know the circumstances, but what can I be positive about now? And what can I be encouraged by now? Mm -hmm. And I also think it's completely normal to be sad about that whole, all of that. Um, I'm still sad about it. Yeah. Um, I would love to know all the answers. I would love to uh, I would love to just know. And I think even if I did know all the answers, I think it would still be sad. You know, you still lost something. So um, it's just a constant battle in an adoptee's brain of thinking about something really deep and hard, but then also just going on with your life. Yeah. So yeah. it's my favorite thing for Megan Devine that's joy and pain can coexist. And we've said it like three times on this podcast, but I love it because that defines adoption for me so well. Um, what was, what kind of things helped you move to being realistic. So obviously naive positivity isn't great to live in forever and grief is hard to live in forever too. So how did you or how did you come to that place of just kind of an understanding of this is my story and there are pieces just missing and that's hard. Yeah. I think one thing that really helped is my parents always spoke so positive about our adoption story, ours being my sister and I's, mm -hmm. because Again, we, we just didn't know much, so why not be positive about it? And they were just always so encouraged and proud of how our family came together. Mm -hmm. They never showed any like, oh, we had to adopt. You know, they, they were never um, ashamed of that, mm -hmm. and they were always excited. And so I think because everyone around me was so excited about it, I still felt allowed I felt allowed to grieve about it, mm -hmm. but I also was so encouraged by my current life. Mm -hmm. And it was really great also to have my sister, who's also an, a Russian adoptee, to talk to about these things. Yeah. And I would probably say she and I were each other's go-to. Um, but I also think adoptees internally process a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And so it can be really hard for parents to even notice if something's wrong. And my parents didn't. I told them about this later. And they're like, oh, I didn't realize that you were having all those deep feelings. And I think that's just because we don't know how to process it, especially being younger. So I think part of how I process it now is I just got older. I think part of that's just, you know, part of growing up and, sure. 
and just realizing um, who you are and your identity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that identity formation does happen during the teen years. And so a lot of adoptees can start to struggle. And so I think it's important that parents just know, like, during this developmental period, which is typically 12 to about 25, it's a huge identity formation period. And so just watching signs and symptoms that things might be getting hard for our child or allowing open conversations, which it sounds like your family did yeah. a really great job with. You wrote in your book that you felt empowered through your adoption. Talk to me about that feeling. Yeah. It kind of goes back to what you're saying about positivity, but in there I say positivity doesn't mean ignoring the pain. Mm -hmm. And I think I just got to a point where I was tired of hearing purely negative adoption stories mm -hmm. um, from adoptees. And I think it's totally fine if someone has a negative experience and wants to voice that. But if you can't get to some level of positivity about something in your life, let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. It's okay if you think something's all negative, but let's get something positive today that you can mm -hmm. that you can think about. I don't want to force anyone to be grateful. That's not what I'm saying. I just think um, there's always something that you can do about your current life mm -hmm. and what you can do about yourself now and today. I think that it's empowering then to look at what you can be positive about today and something that I have always been positive about is adoption. Mm -hmm. So I think that kind of went hand in hand with each other. Were there ever times that you and your sister weren't on the same path and was that difficult? I think it's hard because again, since we internalize so much, I might not know, mm -hmm. but my sister doesn't care as much about learning about the Russian culture and I want to learn all about it. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard when we were growing up, I would want to go eat Russian food and learn about the language and she wouldn't care. Yeah. And I thought that was her not being proud of our heritage when really she just expressed it differently. Yeah. Because she is proud of it. Sure, and every child is going to express that differently. Yeah. And I think that's something that's hard with international adoption, especially, is you don't only have adoption conversations, mm -hmm. you have country uh, conversations as well. That's a great point. So every time my parents brought up Russia, mm -hmm. that would in turn just bring up adoption and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So I think it adds another layer of excitement and learning, but then it also adds a layer of, you know, just what I was talking about before, if a teacher mentions Russia, I'm like, oh, adoption, lost family, you know, <laughs> which sounds so dramatic, but in my head, especially as a child in elementary school, that's what was going through my mind, you know? It doesn't sound dramatic to me at all. It sounds like <laughs> you were very self-aware. Um, and there is so much grief that happens for kids, even when they're really little. And the way that their brains process and internalize things might sound dramatic to adults, but that is what happened in your brain when, when those conversations happened. And other adoptees, um, not to say woe is me or anything, I'm, I love my adoption story, but something with international is that since it's a closed adoption, my parents don't have any blanks to fill in. Mm -hmm. um, some parents, adoptive parents can say, oh, well, your, your birth family, insert the blank, and mine can't. Mm -hmm. And what's great is that they also didn't make up answers and they didn't lie about it. They just said, we don't know. And I, I love that. Looking back, um, that probably was really hard to say. Yes. You know, I know my little sister came up to my dad and said like, why are we left? And my dad was like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> you know? And that is a hard question for a parent to answer because they want to fix it. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to say you're precious and you're wonderful and like you are ours and we're so glad. But like, also, I can't answer that for you. And that is so painful. Mm -hmm. um, and so especially not having those birth family ties, like sometimes our domestic families get to have can be really hard. Yeah. And some international adoptees do have that and some don't. Yes. When you um, kind of were growing up and celebrated the Russian culture. What was that like once the U.S. and it, Russia stopped working together with adoptions? Oh my gosh, it broke my heart. I think that was December 2012 when Russia was closed um, for international adoption. And um, that's just uh, painful. I think that if family reunification isn't possible, then adoption is a great option. Mm -hmm. And people that are critical of adoption say to me, well, I think you might be better off with your family. I've heard that, better better off with your birth family. To which I would say, you know, maybe, but in my circumstance, I was in an orphanage for 18 months. Um, family reunification in my paperwork said that that wasn't of interest. Mm -hmm. So to me, I just think, what would have been better? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's hard to just answer all those unknowns, mm -hmm. but I think that I do respect different cultures wanting to care for their own people. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, let's also, again, know and acknowledge what people have done well. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not all bad. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. What about, and um, what, for you, what was it like, um, did you ever get to go back to that country? Did you ever get to 
experienced some of that culture? Is that something you're still interested in? What's that like today? So um, in college and undergrad, I took the Russian language. Mm -hmm. It was so hard. Yeah. <laughs> um, I really struggled with it a lot. One, because everything that the teacher mentioned, she would say, well, Russians, da, 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 da. And in my head, I'm like, well, I'm Russian, mm -hmm. but not culturally. And so yeah. it, I think it really even took up to the freshman year of college for me to realize, you know what, I'm genetically Russian mm -hmm. and not culturally, mm -hmm. and that is okay. I don't have to mm -hmm. prove it to people. You know, I'm American culturally. Mm -hmm. And so I think just having that good balance of um, culturally and not culturally, but DNA wise, yeah. I can still be proud of that. Yeah. And so learning the language, I really enjoyed, even though it kind of was hard sometimes just internalizing things too much. And um, then in 2015, I got to go back to Russia um, with mi a mission work and it was amazing. And I went there because I wanted to help others and I got to see the culture, I got to eat the food. I loved pretty much all the food yeah. <laughs> and I'm a picky eater. so. That's, That's saying like a, a lot, deal. I know. Yeah. <laughs> and just hearing the language around me. Um, one thing about international travel is that you don't actually realize how much you eavesdrop <laughs> in normal yeah. life, you know? And so it was just really fun to kind of try to listen in and try to see if I could understand words here and there, ordering off menus, you know, just exciting things with travel. Yeah. But there was also another part of me that had to take myself out of the situation and not subconsciously look for people that had the same characteristics as me. Sure. Russia's a big country, so <laughs> yeah, it was really exciting. I'm really thankful I got to go, mm -hmm. but I can't tell you I was 100% present there all the time. I think I was definitely in my, in my mind a little bit too, yeah. which isn't a bad thing. Again, like you said, I think I'm just self-aware. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on reunification? We hear a lot of adoptees say sometimes that they feel like they didn't have the option I don't know what you know specifically about your birth family history, if that was even an option, but kind of what are your thoughts and perceptions and has anyone ever said anything maybe unkind or judgmental in your experience with that? Yeah, I think coming from my personal perspective of international closed adoption, not knowing much, I do know that I was relinquished and then left in an orphan wing for 18 months. So... In my documents, it says that reunification, they tried to reach out to Ken. No one was interested, um, which hurts. <laughs> yeah. And so for me, in my personal story, I'm like, what would be a better alternative for me? Mm -hmm. And I think adoption by my current family was a great option. To say that reunification is always best, mm -hmm. I just don't know if that's true. But I do think it makes me feel good in a way that they always try to reunify with mm -hmm. some kind of kin. And if that still isn't possible, then I think adoption's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And it is sad to know that no kin or anyone was interested in pursuing a life with me, mm -hmm. but it also just makes adoption with my current family that much sweeter. And I will say too that I'm not mad or bitter at my birth family. Um, I would just love to tell them that I'm doing great and I love them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's another thing about the misconception of when people say, do you wanna meet your real family? Mm -hmm. Well, what do you mean real family? I say it all the time that the others aren't robots. I know, <laughs> like they're real all, versus fake, like they're, they're yeah, both human. They're all breathing at one point. And so I think for adoptees, myself specifically, we have to decompartmentalize a lot of things and where our identity fits in places. Mm -hmm. And for me to have these long lost birth parents is so weird to think about, but I still love them and care for them as people. I just can't put faces and, and realistic pictures in my mind of them. In the story. Right, yeah. right. So um, I think it's really great that adoption today, adoptees have more of a say if they're older mm -hmm. or birth family can actually choose the family. I think that's that is really sweet. Some good empowering options yeah. there. What do you think about like finding your birth family? Is that something you've ever considered? Um, I know every adoptee is different on that journey and everyone has different views. What has that been like for you? Yeah. Well, first off, I want to say that's a great question to ask me in this setting, yeah. but it is the weirdest how many times <laughs> I've been asked that question by strangers or people that just met me. And it's so weird what people will ask adoptees when it's like, oh, that's a really deep question. It's like, probably I, the top three questions yeah. that adoptees get, really. <laughs> like, yeah. adoptees can almost predict the questions we're going to get asked, I feel like, yeah. especially if they're open to talking about it. Sure. Um, but I don't know if I want to kind of do a search and reunion. One with international, it's just a lot harder to search. Mm -hmm. And it just takes a lot more resources. That being said, it's hard to answer if it's worth it because I, it's an impossible question to answer because I want to fast forward 
to the ending to see would this have been a positive experience for not just me, but for my birth family as well? Would this have been a positive experience? Can I fast forward and say if it wasn't going to be a positive experience? You know, and, <laughs> and I'm never going to get those answers. Um, so I guess the easy answer is I'm just not not ready to yet. Yeah. But it's a really hard question to answer because I want to fast forward and know what the outcome is. Right. Um, because I've met adoptees with really positive reunification stories or just meeting stories and others with um, absolutely horrible ones. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I think it's interesting, too. So you and your sister are both adopted. Um, and I don't, I don't want you to answer for her specific story, but do you guys have differing opinions on that or do you share a similar opinion? Because it's kind of 50-50 for adoptees who have a sibling. Sometimes they are exactly the same. Sometimes they're completely opposite. And that can be hard too. Yeah. Well, Laura, I think she is kind of on the same boat with me as far as reunification, but I'm probably more team Russia mm -hmm. and um, learning about the culture and that kind of thing. Yeah. Whereas it's ironic though, because she actually does know a little bit more about her birth family. Mm -hmm. She actually has birthdays of siblings, and I just know I wasn't the first born, okay. if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's also hard. Another reason why it's an impossible question is because I want to know their opinion on meeting me as well. So, you know, it's just it's just really, how would you suggest I get the answers, you know? Yeah, so. that seems very empathetic to, to consider their perspective as well in that. Um, I think sometimes it's hard to take outside of our own box, but I really appreciate that you're saying that you also consider would this be positive for my birth family. Yes. Yes. It's hard to know the answer. Yeah. Someone asked me what would I say to my birth parents and I was like, wow, that is a really hard question. And I would just say, I love you and care for you and I'm doing great. And, um, but again, it's like, what do you say? <laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that perspective because I definitely think it is, it's such a vulnerable question to ask someone and I appreciate that you were even open to it, but it's also hard, like with etiquette wise, like that's a top three question. Why? That's so hard. Um, how do we ask adopt these questions to learn their perspectives and still be respectful? Yeah. I think the top thing is after an adoptee shares is to thank them, which yeah. <laughs> is oh, great. Check. I know you did, did that. that. <laughs> um, and I think another thing then is don't ask an adoptee a question like that, that you just met or just found out they were adopted. Yeah. But if it's a friend or a family member that you've known for a really long time, I would just preface any question with, hey, do you mind if I ask about this? Or they can, or you can just ask them, how are you feeling about this adoption in general? Yeah. And they're going to tell you what they think. I mean, every adoptee is different. It's so hard to speak for, for everyone. Um, but just based on my experience, I would prefer some kind of lead up of, this is going to be an adoption related question because most of the time people walk up to me, no context. Hey, do you want to meet your birth family? Yeah. Ah. So <laughs> yeah, maybe just give us like a little heads up mm -hmm. just so our brains can switch to yes. adoptee mode. You can like buckle your seatbelt. Yeah. Here we go. Guys. Yes, okay. exactly. Well, I have a question for you. So what can parents do or what did your parents do? that helps you feel secure in your identity as an adoptee? And that can be for different ages, it can be... Yeah, that's a great question. It probably goes back to never being ashamed of our family's story mm -hmm. and always being positive, especially when they talked about adoption around me and my sister with other adults. If the adults need to go away and have a different conversation, that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, but my parents never complained that adoption was the way that they were gonna build their family. Yeah. It was never a second option. I never felt less than number one, you know, me and my sister. Mm -hmm. um, they also let me decide how open or closed to be with other people about adoption and with them mm -hmm. about adoption. So my sister, she doesn't talk about it a lot, mm -hmm. um, and I talk about it all the time. <laughs> yeah, you're interning I, I know. <laughs> I'm interning at adoption agency. Um, so I think they let me choose how open to be about it. Okay. And I think that's really important. And also you can just check in with your kid. I mean, at mm -hmm. every so often, um, I think international adoption does have the advantage of, you don't necessarily have to check in with the kid about adoption. You can check in about their culture, their birth culture, right? Because like I said, it's all inter interwoven. So if you have an, a Russian adoptee as a child and you say, hey, do you wanna go get some Russian food? Yeah. You can maybe see how they react to that, mm -hmm. and that might give you a hint to how they're feeling on adoption. Mm -hmm. I also just think don't make adoption 
the reason you do everything in parenting either. Mm. Like there might be adoption related hardships or themes, which definitely, sure. or there might be normal 12 year old related themes as well. So don't just assume automatically everything's adoption related that's negative mm. and don't assume that everything adoption related is positive either. Yeah. I, it's just hard to talk about because everyone's so different, but Absolutely. just check in and be proud of your family. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Well, Elena, thank you so much for sitting with me and sharing your story today. It was so vulnerable, and I'm so honored that you shared this space with us today. And so grateful that you wrote this book for families and for kiddos to be able to connect, hear different stories of adoptees, um, and kind of find their place in their identity. Yeah. One thing I really like about that is that because there's 50 adoptees in there all answering the same questions, it really shows you those common themes yeah. of what maybe goes in adoptees' minds, what we're, yeah. what we're thinking. Um, but then it also shows the uniqueness of every story too. And it's wonderfully done. So it's been, <laughs> it's been a gift for me to get to read just as a professional in the field. So great work on that. Thanks. <laughs> we'll have the link to purchase this book in your show notes, um, as well as some of the links that Elena has created to help families have conversations um, about adoption um, and connecting with cultural trips. Elena, thank you so much for tuning in today. And thank you guys for tuning into another episode of Reframed. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to the Reframed podcast. Be sure to visit gladneyuniversity.org to access the show notes and discover upcoming trainings at Gladney University. We'd love your feedback. So please head to iTunes and rate, review, and subscribe. Until next time.